So who is Jonathan Greenberg? He is an award-winning national investigative journalist, editor, author, and new media innovator committed to creating a better world by informing to, uh, informing to Empower, which is the name of the public interest nonprofit media publisher that he founded in 2015 to publish the Sonoma Independent and the Maui Independent News websites. Jonathan was a Web, web 1.0 pioneer uh, founding GIST Communications in 1996, an internet company that competed successfully with TV Guide Online in 1997. GIST was one of just 14 websites in the world to be named a winner of the first annual Webby Awards in San Francisco. So before any further ado, we have, I bring you, Jonathan Greenberg. How are you doing, Jonathan? How are you doing, my friend? I haven't seen you in a long time. It's great, Egberto. It's fun to be on your show and on, on, on the video format, too. It's great. Hey. Listen, man, it, it's great. I mean, uh, I I saw it, it was funny because I was sitting down on in the living room, right, and um, I saw this guy pop up on the screen and uh, talking about these tapes from Donald Trump and all of that. And I got up, I said, I looked at my wife and I said, "That's Jonathan. John, I know Jonathan. He never told me he was a buddy of Donald Trump or anything like that. Tell me a little bit about that story, man." Well. I, I, when I was uh, out of college, I started working at Forbes as a as a as a researcher, fact checker, and and after a year there, they had this new project, the Forbes 400, and they wanted a researcher who really was like into digging to 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 be the head of research for it. So it was a 13 month pro project. I was tapped to create it with Malcolm Forbes, and um, and then they added a lot of other people. On the you know uh, onto the staff and became the biggest project that Forbes did, and remains so to this day. But for three years, I was the I I managed the research and I especially managed the real estate for it. So um, I I had some contacts through my family in real estate and I talked to people and I was I was sort of the young guy who went out and talked to them about how much other each each of them was worth and how much the other guys were worth. So I met Donald Trump for the first time in reference to that in June of 1982. And I had no idea that, you know, that he would see this as his opportunity to con his way into the major league and to borrow billions of dollars for banks uh, from Las Vegas. So he began this full court press to create this fiction of what he actually owned, that he owned it and his father didn't own it. And that fiction developed over course of years, the next three years. He had Roy Cohn call me and lie to me, you know, about what he was looking at. I didn't really, I knew who Roy Cohn was. And I said, can you send me those documents, Mr. Cohn? He was like, I can't do that. Um, you know, he wanted me to take his word for it. You know, the most notorious fixer in American history, knowing as, as I did even then that he was a mob lawyer and the McCarthyite fixer who had that list of the communists, suspected communists. <laughs> that was his list that Donald Trump has $500 million in liquid assets and he's looking at a bank statement. And it was like, gee, what does this remind me of? And then the year later, Donald Trump himself, his secretary said, this year, you're not going to meet Donald because I'd met him two years in a row for hours and hours. That you sat down and spoke to him about his I income. Sat down, spoke to him. He created a show for me. He, the first time I met him, I got to tell you this story because this seems to never make it into print, but it'll make it on your show, Egberto. First um, time. There we go. Here it goes. I'm sitting there. Well, first of all, he, you know, Ivanka comes in holding a piece of marble. He wants to show off his trophy wife. It was like, you know, to this 23 year old reporter, Donald is 33 at the time. He had just turned 34 and, and he wants to show off his wife. And he says, isn't she great? You know, as she's walking, he's like, you know, I got a 10, right? <laughs> and, and a great taste. She's showing and she comes in and she, kiss, she meets me. She sits on his lap and she kisses him. It's like, so then she walks out. So I'm interviewing him for hours and I show him this list. And the way I did the list is I ranked the different people based upon their fortunes on what I had known and let them talk about each other and, you know, and what they think is wrong or who's got a lot of debt or who's missing from the list. And I had the best, it was the best list of New York real estate that had been done. No one had tried it before. And, and Donald saw like, these people and he is he and his father were like at the bottom of the list with a question mark 
you know, with other people, <laughs> maybe a hundred million, which was the cutoff. Right. He saw the list, his face dropped like, like he was shocked and he was so upset because he wanted to be at the top of his list. Right. So right then he started a full court press with me and with Forbes to get to the top of the list. He said, I, I've got, you know, your, your list is way off. I've got more than any of these people. And I was like, you know, I knew a fair amount about it. I said, I know you're full of shit. It's like, how full of shit are you? So while I'm talking to him, his secretary comes in and he says, Mr. Trump, your father's on the phone. And I said, uh, he said, okay, I'll take this. It'll just be a few minutes, he says to me. And I said, would you like me to go outside? You know, would you like me to step outside from this gigantic office he's in? He says, no, no, you sit there. So I sat there, I pretended to, you know, I was looking at, but it was all a show. So he's talking in the phone and he's talking about buying these um, treasury bills and notes. And he says, no, dad, we got to buy the 20 year. Let, let's put 20 million into that. Uh, the <laughs> and, and I want to liquidate this fund. And what's being demonstrated is that he's the one in control of the family money. He's advising his father how to invest it. And so I'm sort of moving closer, you know, looking at stuff on his desk, this giant desk. And I'm listening. And I'm like, there is no voice at the other end of that phone. <laughs> and, and I move a little closer and he notices that I notice. And he says, OK, Dad, I'm being interviewed by Forbes for the Forbes 400 right now. I'm going to hang up. And he hangs up and he looks at me and he says, that was my father. He asked me about these kind of things. I went to Wharton. And, and, and I really, <laughs> are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. It, it never happened. I mean, it, there was no one on the other phone and he never had those monies. I mean, as the New York, you know, over the years, a lot of people have written about Donald Trump's wealth um, and, and documents have come out about, you know, the, and the estate after his father died, he didn't have any control of his father's money and they've never been liquid. They've never invested in T-bills. All their money was in, you know, was in projects and they took out of projects and in trust funds. So the whole thing was, you a know, charade. a charade. So two years later, when instead of going to meet him, his secretary calls me um, and says, John, you know, Donald's not going to talk to you for the Forbes 400 this year. John Barron, the VP of finance, is going to talk to you now because I was in my office. And we had I had a tape recorder connected to the phone. I recorded the calls and they are and, and another one. And, and they followed it up again in August. And they are the only recordings in existence of Donald Trump pretending to be John Barron. Um, there was one recording of him pretending to be John Miller that was 11 minutes long about him bragging about his, the, how much how great he, uh, uh, a husband he was or how great a boyfriend. And how right. much wants to sleep with him? That 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 tape did not have, um, you know, it, it, it was not given by the journalist who had done it. It was secondhand, and, and he denied it. This tape he couldn't deny. I mean, when I found the tape like thirty five years later, and I went back for this Washington Post series, and I went back and I looked up, you know, what had happened since then, and I realized how deliberate the con was and how he had played me and where the lies were. Because all those years, what I did was, it was like Donald Trump says he's worth 700 million and we say and he's- you wrote it down. <clears throat> no, 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 I didn't write it down. I mean, I went through all this stuff and I was like, I'm doing a good job. All these years I thought I did a really good job because he said he was worth 500 million, we said 100 million. He said he was worth the next year 600 million. We said he was worth, he and his father were worth 200 million. And every, and he would write letters to the editor of Forbes. The first year he called my editor and he said, who is this kid you're sending down? He's an idiot. Send someone who knows what the fuck, I'm sorry, what, what he's <laughs> doing to, um, you know, to interview me. And of course my editor went down and he said, Jonathan's got all these numbers and his estimates are good. He's right. And we're not going to change anything. So then he writes to Malcolm Forbes and he says, your staff doesn't know what it's doing. I'm worth much more. Every year he send these letters to Forbes to arguing because the, the number that Forbes had was, was much more. So, so, so that's how Donald Trump cons. 
he moves the guidepost. I went. So let me let me stop you a second uh, to to let our audience know. So you at, at that point you were working for Ford uh, for Forbes magazine, and you were putting these pieces together uh, every year with all the billionaires uh, in the area. It, at first, it was centi millionaires. Over a hundred million was the cutoff. The cutoff okay. is now two billion. So okay, got it. But. Um, I was doing the assessments, especially the private wealth. I mean, this is really easy when you have stock and everyone sees how much there is. Real right. estate is very complicated. It was my expertise through the 1980s. Uh, you really have to think of how many mortgages. You, you, you sort of measure the differential between the value when they bought it and the value now. That's mm -hmm. a good way to do it. Um, so, but, but we thought, it turns out, as I found out, 35 years later that Donald Trump was trying to get a casino license and had gone into the New Jersey Gaming Commission and he had given his real assets that were because he had to sign a legal statement and said, this is what I have. And those real assets were worth under five million dollars. And he, no. he, he was worth a hundred million. And had I known that in Jersey City, in some file cabinet, at that, at that moment, there was a document which I might have been able to get had I driven there and found it and known about it, that showed that the estimates that I was playing, that he was already playing me. My job was to see, I thought, to make sure that he did not get put down for $500 million, like people who are actually worth five hundred million, but only $100 million. In fact... Right. The only, and that's how Trump plays it, only 100 million was already bullshit because he was worth less than 10 million. He should never have been on the list. And neither should his father at that time. Because that, he told them they had 25,000 apartments and they only had, eight, had, had uh, like not 8,000. That is amazing. So, um, so let me ask you this. When, when, it, when it occurred, I mean, when this story broke, because like I told you, I just happened to be watching the TV and uh, MSNBC uh, broke the story saying, oh, there's a Washington Post article by a Jonathan Greenberg. And then it, the stuff hit the fan. And every, every single network then picked up your story on having those tapes. And those tapes were played all over the world. Yeah. And The Daily Show, Trevor Noah did a great, called it, the origin lie upon which Trump built his bullshit career. Right. And such a great job on it. He called it lie maintenance. And then in the behind the scenes, Trevor Noah took, he was talking to this other, this other commentator, turned to the audience and said, he held up the, the Forbes. He said, this is the new definition of white privilege. Exactly. Said, a white man goes, Donald Trump went into the bank with this Forbes article, and he said, lend me $300 million to, to buy this, build this building in Atlantic City. He said, if a brother, if a dark-skinned person went into a bank and said, here I am in Jet Magazine, and, you know, I'm paid <laughs> $100 million, they would have said, are you crazy? Get out of here. Oh, well, let me, I can tell you a story. I went for $40,000. And they asked me, did you have $40,000 to back it in assets? And I said, no, but I had excellent credit. The guy laughed me out of the bank. Mm. Yeah. That's the name of the game. But anyhow, yeah. um, but let me ask you, so what do you think he's really worth, Jonathan, based on all your experience with uh, going through his numbers? I, well, back then he was worth, he, he has inherited from his father that real estate has appreciated. He did go bankrupt. He was worth, in 1991, went you know, months after he was writing letters to Forbes complaining and insisting that he was worth a billion and a half dollars, he was actually worth negative $200 million. He had sunk that low. So let me ask you something. How can somebody who's worth in, and this is what I have always said is wrong with an account, the type of economy that, that we have. If he's worth negative $200 million, how does he recover from that not having any assets in his name and having proven that he has the ability to lose $200 million. How do you get a second chance? That's a, that's a really good question. And that is reinventing himself. So by 1991, he had taken $3 billion in loans for Atlantic City and real estate and the overpaid plaza. And he's like, you know, this is, 
I'm not allowed to curse, am I? No. No, you can't use the F word. <laughs> Donald Trump does a lot, by the way. Yes, I know. <laughs> he, he does it a lot. But so I'll try not to use that that word. But he 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 goes in to the lenders and you know who he owes three billion dollars. He says, "Listen, there's two ways this can happen. It could be worth absolutely zero, or if you want to get two hundred million dollars out of this, you play ball with me and let me turn this around. You know, let me at least get you know I'll get you two hundred million dollars, or you take the three million dollar three billion dollar haircut." And they're like. Um, we thought you, and he said, look, this, this is, so they put him on an allowance of only $300,000 a month. <laughs> he had to sell his private jet and his yacht and the Plaza hotel and all these assets that he sold. And that was his allowance. He got literally an allowance and then he borrowed from his father. And then he figured out that if banks, no bank Here's the thing to understand about Trump and the Russian money laundering and the oligarchs. No legit Donald Trump's reputation in New York City as of 1990-91 was mud. Not a single legitimate business person would ever lend him money or be his partner or go into business with him. As I said in the six Trump's cons, Trump's six essential cons you know, Donald, to be a winner every time, Donald Trump makes losers out of everyone who did, he does business with. Actually, yeah. you know what I'd like you to do? Uh, do you have the article in front of you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'd like you, uh, let's go ahead and uh, explain those six cons that you talked about in that article. Sure. Enumerate them for the audience. Uh, con number one, to borrow billions, Trump lies to inflate his net worth, which we're talking about. Con number two, to avoid taxes, Trump lies to deflate his net worth. By the way, he's still doing everything that's on here. He still is saying that his, you know, his golf courses, he values them at $15 million, but when he goes to pay taxes on him, his attorney says it's only worth $1.4 million. <laughs> I mean, this is happening today, my friend. As Number the president of the United States. The president of the United States. He has lawyers suing the real estate for lower real estate assessments everywhere he has. So on one hand, he says it's worth 50 million. When he goes to pay taxes, he says, you've assessed me at, you know, at $5 million, it's only worth 1.4 million. And here's why. And he ties them up in court and then they settle, they settle. So con number three, to be a winner, Trump makes losers of those he does business with. And then I say, to make every business deal with him sound sweeter than it was, Trump marketed his name as synonymous with gold-plated luxury. But few of his deals had happy endings. His narcissistic need to be a winner every time meant that there were losers every time. This meant just about anyone who made the mistake of signing a contract to lend or partner or supply goods or service. To After stifling his partners, you know, so, so that's, that's another one. Con number four, to win in politics, Trump makes voters believe that his presidency benefits them. And that goes to something that you've talked about and that we've talked about together years ago, which is the big con of the grand oligarch party, the Republicans, is this idea of getting, you know, working class people to vote against their economic self-interest. Um, and Trump does it, you know, with the traditional ways of you know, playing the fear card, the white male grievance card, you know, and, and um, you know, the, 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 the scapegoating card of it's these people taking your money. It's because of these, you know, these, these, these Central Americans coming in and these immigrants. And when, he, when he was benefiting from just about everything that none of us actually could. Now, um, let me ask you, did you get, before we go back into that article with the, the different cons that he's doing, what kind of pushback did you get? Did you get the, the White House contacting you or anything like that to try to shut you up or get those tapes? Or did they, are you worried about them monitoring you now or what? Well, I got to tell you, I, you know, the editor of the Washington Post is made Marty Barron, the guy who made the Spotlight movie about. Right. Is really one of the greatest. It ed is the greatest editor I've ever experienced in my life. I, you know, whatever else you say about Jeff Bezos, there is a wall between the editorial, you know, and the and 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 the publishing. He's given them money to go out after this, and he was. 
they, they, they had an amazing editorial team and lawyers. And they said, you've got it before we go, you've got to take this to the white house. And here's the, and, and you've got to put it in front of them and give them a chance for comment. And then I got a call and they, I said, you got 6 PM till 6 PM Eastern time. I, I get this phone call from the de deputy press secretary of, of Trump's press secretary, the white house. And he said, Donald's the president is on the golf course right now with Sarah. We've got the tapes. We need, before we can make a comment, we need to play them for him. And he hasn't had a chance to listen to them. So we'd like you to extend the deadline till 8 p.m. because the, the Washington Post was coming at it like midnight that night online. Mm -hmm. And I said, so I got permission. I said, okay. The call, and, and then my editor said, my editor who was working with me said, they're not going to comment because they know it's legitimate. True. In truth, he never called me back because unlike the other tape, you know, I I had a there, there's something called a chain of custody with Don, right. and I had I had physically the tapes with the name on it, John Barron, um, and and I had um, I had never it had never been out of my possession, and the fact is, unlike the other thing, which supposedly he received the call and Donald Trump as John Miller talking about Madonna wanting to date him and what a great partner he was for Marla Maples, unlike that tape where somebody called in the reporter, he said, look, anyone could call in pretending to be me. And, you know, what do you say to that? In this right. case, you know, his secretary <laughs> arranged an appointment with Forbes, two appointments at a specified time, and I received a call from John Barron at that time. There was no, and he, he knew that. Um, now, here's the amazing thing. Rush Limbaugh also mentioned this story to see how it was played. No kidding, huh? Yeah, he did. He, he insulted me, of course. He said, how could this guy be, anyway, he's such, he said, how can this guy be still alive today if it was, you know, well, anyway, 25 years ago, 35 years ago, he, he um, but he said that, uh, and, you know, and maybe Trump did do it and sort of, you know, it just shows that Forbes was duped and that Trump is a really persuasive guy. It was like good for him for getting away with it. Right. And I think that, Trump feels that way too. That he got away with it. Oh, he got got over Forbes, and now he's president of the United States. Yeah, and you were asking about how he got money after the bankruptcies. He actually right. went public with the with casino companies, and while while investors saw their stock between two thousand and nineteen ninety five in Trump casinos in two thousand and eight, while they saw the stock go from thirty five dollars to seventeen cents a share. Wow. Donald Trump made during those years in compensation $83 million. How did he do that? That's how much he paid himself or did he short Got the stock? It, my friend. He's the CEO and he's Donald Trump. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, when I say he made losers of everyone he did business with, that's not. So by the end of all this, there's no way this guy's going to take a company public. The Apprentice was the greatest thing to ever happen to him. It was made completely on bullshit. And it and the the Russian oligarch and mob money and Putin's money floated his properties. And the only bank to lend to him is Deutsche Bank, which is under investigation for over 20 billion dollars of money laundering with not just drug cartels, but mostly, oh, Russian oligarchs. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so it's it. That's why he is beholden to the Russians. I mean, because. You know, he is reliant upon him. They're the only ones who will lend money to him. Okay, so you know for a fact then that it, that he is getting money from the Russians uh, for all his endeavors. Well, you know, the great journalist Craig Unger wrote House of Trump, House of Putin, and he really traces the money that came in from them. He's getting money for, you know, is it just money laundering and he wants to allow oligarchs to spend their, you know, money on his overpriced properties or is there a quid pro quo where he you know where do you prove the quid pro quo that this is why he is coddling you know russia and wants to you know help them in this way and that way and why he believes putin and not the intelligence agencies of the united states you know it's it's that the, the quid pro quo is hard to prove the the investment of russian oligarchs and that's where we're hoping many journalists and, 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 and voters 
are hoping that the tax returns, you know, show his reliance um, upon those types of loans. And that's where the Deutsche Bank thing gets really interesting, right. Marky, because you know who was head of Deutsche Bank United States who gave those loans. Uh, what is his name again? Uh, he was in the administration. No, it's the previous the administration of of the Supreme Court Justice Kennedy. Oh, wait, say that again. Kennedy, the Supreme Court Justice who mysteriously resigned. Right here, uh, it's his son. I didn't know that. I I know that some. Okay, wow. So he uh, he is implicated in greenlighting all the money to Trump that the, the money laundering operations from the funds of the private wealth funds, the offshore private wealth funds that Deutsche Bank specialized in on behalf of Russian oligarchs. Jonathan, Putin himself. Let's see if you're making a little bit of uh, let's see if you're making a little bit of news that could be used conspiratorially. Um, are you saying maybe Kennedy's stepping down could have been an order from the president in order to? Uh, is that a possibility? Yes. Yes. Is that what you're implying? Oh yeah, yeah. Kennedy stepping down is seen as you know, and it has to do with executive branch power. I mean, what Kavanaugh is the ultimate, the quintessential political fixer. Yes, yeah. He, and there's likely to be a split vote about the use of executive power when it comes to subpoenaing Trump and and uh, possibly indicting him. Um, so and I guess Roberts is our only savior right now, huh? He is, surprisingly. Roberts is the only savior America has right now. You, what do you expect from Kavanaugh? Wow. Um, and I, I, the good thing about it is in as much as Roberts is a right-wing guy, I, th I honestly think he cares about the country a bit more. <laughs> I hope so. But, you know, you don't – this this one you don't really know. You know, these people pride themselves with what they call loyalty. And it's right. loyalty to the party, loyalty to the megalomaniac who controls this, and loyalty to the Constitution and the laws – I mean, the, these Supreme Court justices are political fixers in black robes. Oh, that, that, that five person, that four oh. person majority, maybe five. All right, before we go to your book and give you a chance to plug your book as well, let me go and ask you, um, what, where do we go from here? I ask a lot of my, um, the journalists that come on board, what do, where, where are we going? Okay, well, just quickly, I'm going to do the other two uh, cons. Okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Avoid accountability. Trump makes the media and truth the enemy of the people. And six, to stoke fear, Trump recasts perpetrators as victims. So I just wanted to say these are, this is his MO. This is how he succeeds. And this is the pathology that his followers, uh, that, that allow his followers to be incited to him, especially the last three. This idea that, you know, the victim card. So where do we go from here? Um, wait, is that your question? Yeah, where do we go from here? In other words, you know, you know Trump better than most of us. You actually sat next to him. You actually saw his, his antics. Uh, and, and I think you've done a lot of research on him. So where do you think we're sitting? And, you know, first of all, do you think the outcome is that, uh, that it, there's anything negative out of the Mueller report? I, my hunch is that it's going to be a meh when the report comes out. I'm curious. Um, I think the, 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 the invest, I, I think it's going to show, um, you know, um, a lot of financial interdependence mm -hmm. and, and on, um, I mean, the idea of continuing with the, the Moscow Trump tower, Trump hotel talks well into the past the campaign, well into his presidency, the idea of covering those up. I think his tax returns are very, uh, very important. Um, the false statements he made to to insurance companies in New York State are very important. I do believe that uh, Letitia Jones, who I met when she was a council member back when I worked in the city council in two thousand, mm -hmm. I think she's gonna. I think she's. I think she's going to end up really, really digging both him and Kushner and the statements they've made. I mean, he's gotten away with so much for so many years. The, the, 
overall charge of, of collusion and proving that quid pro quo is, you know, it's going to be very difficult. But I think the, um, the reason I, and Jerry Nadler, who's, you know, bringing in. He's working the, hard at it. Yeah. Bring up the tax returns. They're going to investigate and they should. That's their job. And, you know, the improprieties and, and using, you know, uh, you know, his office to enrich themselves. I think I think the impeachment, obviously, the Senate's never going to vote to remove two thirds of the Senate, but mm -hmm. 19 Republican senators to vote to remove. But I think impeachment would be helpful in in letting people understand the scandals and providing documentation and witnesses as to what a con man he is. And then, you know, this Congress, the House could vote to impeach and the Senate could vote not to remove. But in the meantime, it's going to the headlines. We're going to take we've really got to take the headline power that he has, which the media, as you know, has. I mean, how much time did CNN give him in the campaign and how much time did he give Two Bernie? billion Sanders? dollars worth. Yes. Right. And, and what did he give? They give Bernie Sanders in the media. I mean, that was a sham. The 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 because he gets people's attention. He gets people's attention both on the on the on the right and the left by inciting people. We've got to take that capacity to dominate the headlines away from Donald Trump and give it to the House investigators so that what's there about Trump is Trump's scandals, not Trump's scandalous policies against immigrants or which Jonathan, today. That, yeah. what that means is we have we have uh, we have some power to do that, uh, not as much as the big the big guns, but we can get it out piecemeal. And if I'm doing it, if you're doing it, and a couple more hundred or a couple more thousand of us are doing it out there, we can have our impact where it matters as well. So, I mean, uh, we have to just keep the faith and do what we do. Now, um, we are coming to the end of this segment, but beforehand, I'd like for you to tell us, you decided to, you're, you're an investigative journalist, but now you're an author of a novel. Tell me a little bit about that. America 2034, Utopia Rising. It takes place in Trump's uh, fifth term as president for life. He's the world's first trillionaire. The country is a Putin-style kleptocracy. The Constitution has been rewritten, and he is big brother. Um, and two-thirds of America are in slave labor camps. Millions have died. They're selling their body parts to survive and feed themselves. It is the darkest dystopia, and behind a force field in, Cal in the western coast is the most harmonious utopia in existence, and they are expanding to transform Trump's dark America. That's the premise of the book. It starts with Trump stealing the 2020 election, and that's what I want to focus on, by creating a false flag operation and declaring a state of emergency the day before the election with a staged bomb attacks on polling places, which he blames on Antifa, and he calls a state of emergency and suspends all all internet broadcasts, all communications except official White House communications, and he rounds up political dissidents and voters, and he calls out the National Guard and these Blackwater-style private contractors to every polling place where they snip the hair of people going in to vote, and if they find marijuana residue which stays for three months in the hair. They immediately uh, call it a federal felony because it's still felony, you know. Right, right. And, and takes them off to concentration camps and disenfranchises them never to vote again. 25 million voters don't get to vote, and Trump wins in a landslide in a two-thirds majority in the, set, in, in the Senate and House and then rewrites the Constitution. The concept that Trump would declare a state of emergency for his you know, a wall with no need, with no rationale, built upon lies, just to get hit, win that point. Um, what would Trump do to stay in power and stay out of jail in 2020? And that's the premise of the book, and it's in the first chapter of what he does do to create a dystopia. And that's what I want to say about the book is we need to be very careful, and this will test the power of every one of our institutions to stop, uh, you know, to stop Trump um, in 20, you know, in 2020 from stealing this election. And that is why Michael Cohn testified to Congress. Now, 
Michael Cohn talks about people coming out if he loses the election. And I'm like, I'm the guy who knows about Trump's cons. He doesn't ask for forgiveness after, after the fact. He doesn't ask for permission. He's not going to chance it that they'll put him back in after the election. My concern and the reason I've written this book is a cautionary tale. And I'm on one thing I want to get stress about the book in, in America 2034 on your show is that he I believe he is going to steal this election before the, fir the first vote is counted. Wow. Jonathan, give us the name of the book again. America 2034 Utopia Rising. And where can they find it? It's uh, Amazon paperback, great audio book with a great Trump impersonator and on Kindle as well. Um, and just America. And we have a website, America 2034.com. Please, Jonathan, Jonathan Greenberg. It was a pleasure seeing you again. Uh, maybe we'll meet in uh, Philadelphia later on this year. You have a wonderful, great, a wonderful day. And we'll talk again. Now go enjoy the rest of the day with that great weather you're having out there in California. Thank you. I'm going to make some music. I'll Thanks make so some much. music. Great show. Appreciate Take care, it. buddy. Have a great day. Thank you so kindly. Yeah.